Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues. This is session 15, part 1 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance, where Jesus and Mary continue to discuss God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance, focusing this session on the feelings, emotions, and responses God has generally has towards sin itself, and has when his children choose to sincerely forgive and repent. This session was recorded on the 5th of June 2018 from 10.30 a.m. in Wilsdale, Queensland, Australia. Oh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever hey. you are. <laughs> uh, Mary and I are here together. G'day, darling. How are Hi, you? Hi, darling. Yep. We're here today bringing you the last session of the series of God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance discussions that we've been having as a theme discussion over the past, well, it's been nearly six months, hasn't it? No, oh, longer, probably has been longer actually yeah. than six months. So <laughs> this particular discussion is the last one and we're going to focus our attention this time on how God feels about you getting involved in the process of forgiveness and repentance. We'll talk a bit about God's feelings generally as well, and also God's feelings about sin as well. So that way you get a bit of a context about how God feels about all of these things. So that's the what we're going to do today. Obviously, it's the continuation of the series. Remember the last time we discussed God's role in the process of forgiveness and repentance. So today is a sort of extension of how you know what God the role God plays in you being uh, you becoming a forgiving or a repentant person but also um, we're looking obviously today at how God feels about how you what happens when you know you do do these things how does God feel about you personally doing these particular things so it's a should be a fairly interesting discussion I think today yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, before we get started, let's do a quick review of sessions 1 to 14. We're actually up to session 15 in this series today. And so, needless to say, we've covered quite a lot, mm -hmm. having had uh, 14 sessions. So, mm -hmm. um, if you haven't already watched that material, we really recommend watching the first 14 sessions before you view this material, because it's all built upon, each, each session is built upon itself. and. Uh, there's, uh, we've tried to make it a really well-rounded discussion of God's laws of forgiveness and repentance. Mm. So quickly, let's talk about what we talked about. Sessions one to three in the series, we discussed, we basically laid the foundations, didn't we, for uh, what is this forgiveness and repentance thing all about? What's mm. God's truth about it? What are the laws involved? How do we know truth uh, in the first place? And, mm. and those kinds of things. So very important sessions, weren't mm. they? Yeah. And, and in those sessions, we learned a lot about emotion and the emotional process uh, involved in forgiveness and repentance as well, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. And then, then we moved on to the discussion about the law of compensation. Mm -hmm. And for the next, uh, was it five sessions, I think, four to eight, wasn't it? We and de dealt with compensation in all its particular <laughs> yeah. aspects. Of course, it's not an exhaustive conversation about compensation, mm -hmm. but we had to look at compensation and how it applies to the process of forgiveness and repentance. So that's what we did in those sessions. Because often people get confused, don't they, between, oh, I'm feeling bad, and they call that repentance, when very often it's the operation of compensation. That's actually. right. There's nothing yeah. to do with repentance in many <laughs> cases. So we had to be quite, you know, have, you have to be quite specific about why it is you're feeling bad. And is it because you're actually going through repentance or is mm -hmm. it because you're just... Uh, feeling the effects of the law of compensation working upon you, grinding its way through, through <laughs> yeah, you. On, upon you. And that was something crucial that we saw, wasn't it? That mm. forgiveness and repentance is something that we must engage from a desire within ourselves, mm. whereas compensation acts upon us uh, whether we want it to or not. And, yeah. and we, and so that's why it's a very important distinction to make as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it's during those sessions that we looked at the, the fact that forgiveness and repentance is a voluntary uh, desire based voluntary process, not yeah. something that's forced upon us yeah. so that, you know, that's something that we need to consider. And it also obviously has an effect on how God feels about you doing it too, mm -hmm. because if something has to be forced upon you and you reluctantly do it, obviously, 
you know, when it, when it's like that, then how can somebody feel about you doing it? It's like, well, you're just a reluctant person doing it. But but when it comes to you doing something voluntary because you love to do it or want to yeah. do it, then, then obviously there can be a different feeling that comes from God and also from others about yeah. you doing that. So, oh, and, and it's true, isn't it, that God this gift that we're already given at the time we're born is will and God really wants us to embrace that mm. gift so mm. obviously when we do engage desire and will God's going to have really different feelings we'll talk about that in the session today yeah. as opposed to when it's just compensation yeah yeah all right so let's look at session 9 to 13 where mm -hmm. we moved on and then we talked about this very interesting um truth about the conscience mechanism what it is how it operates how we can become more engaged and aware of the conscience and receive truth directly from god about mm. what's happening in our lives yeah very important session because because it, i think it's probably the first time we've formally discussed uh, the conscience with people yeah. and so hopefully people have found that whole process of you know that mechanism that's been built inside of the soul uh, an interesting thing and mm. also something that they can utilize in their day-to-day mm. -day lives. Mm. Then of course we've got to the last uh, couple of sessions, last week's session or last time session, which was about God's role in the process of forgiveness, repentance, how he, how he helps us. And, and, and you know, in fact, in that session, we learned uh, that without God repentance, full repentance for everything, it's really impossible. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about that, but also mm -hmm. the process of forgiveness and, and what's involved in the process of forgiveness in terms of God's role there as well. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we come to this session. So this session, as we've said, is about God's emotions generally, God's emotions about sin, mm -hmm. and God's emotions about how he feels about uh, when, when we desire to forgive or repent, like what, what, what does God feel about that? Yeah, and we wanted to talk, uh, uh, because we were talking in the last session about God's role in forgiveness and repentance, it was, it was natural, wasn't it, to then move on to say, well, how does God actually feel about us when we engage forgiveness and repentance? But we wanted to do a lot of introduction Mm. about well what god has feelings let's mm. talk about that you know let's let's really get into that topic as well it's a good place to do that yes yeah, so i feel um that a lot of people don't believe that really mm. um i suppose they feel that if god had feelings he'd be doing different things than he's yeah. currently doing so you know we need to discuss why god doesn't do the things people expect even though god does have feelings about mm. what we do mm. so you know that they're all parts of that discussion and, and in the process, hopefully, people will learn a bit more about God and God's feelings for them. Yeah, mm. yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Mm. <laughs> so the first thing we want to discuss is that God is a feeling and emotional being. Mm. So this is something that, as you mentioned in our intro, a lot of people have confusion about. Um, but it's something that you speak about very strongly, that God is, has feelings and emotions mm. and feelings and emotions pertaining to all of her children. Mm. I find it remarkable just generally on this subject that many people who think they believe in God don't consider God to be an emotional being. They, mm. they only sort of see God as an intellectual being with wisdom or power or knowledge and, you know, and qualities like justice and 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 ethics you know mm -hmm. and morality but they don't really see that it's all driven by feelings mm -hmm. and and i find that quite you know strange in a way because it how how can you have love without having a feeling and 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 in fact many people today when they refer to god's love they don't say it's a feeling yeah they say it's god's thought and and it's and i find that very interesting it's God's feeling that love is a feeling mm. and and so God obviously has feelings if God has love then God has feelings and so it's no wonder to me sometimes that people can't feel God because they are thinking that God has thoughts only and do, do not have feelings mm. and then on top of that most of most people even most religious people are denying their feelings so naturally if you're denying your own feelings it's going to be very very difficult to feel the feelings of somebody else yeah and, and very much so, uh, it is going to be impossible to feel God's feelings. So, so there are many sort of questions surrounding this issue of God having feelings that I feel we need to have some kind of discussion about in this se series because, because there, there is this general belief on the planet that God does not really have feelings. Mm. And, and also that God's love is not a feeling, mm. it's a principle. 
Uh, and and that's not the case at all. It's actually a feeling. So are you saying, though, because, I mean, what you're describing about people's perception of God in terms of thoughts versus feelings, I see that it's a growing trend on the earth that people say, look, your thoughts create your feelings. In fact, your thoughts are the most important things. Your thoughts, it's all in your mind. It's a thought-based existence, mm. not an emotion-based existence. So it's mm. really a projection onto God. Is, is it that or is it something else? Oh, I think it's partly that. You know, mm. most people on earth want to deny their own feelings mm. and then to contemplate, you know, having a relationship with God for those who do want one. They feel like, well, you know, I want to deny my own feelings, so it's better if I can. Mm. They also s sort of see their own feelings as quite evil and destructive in most cases. And, and that unfortunately is true. There are many feelings on earth that people retain that they never release that are quite evil and destructive. And so mm. they sort of believe all feelings must be evil and destructive. And that's not the case at all. And so there's a, there is a lot of imposition upon God from the human experience of what God should be or, or is rather than thinking in a logical manner about the fact that we as humans have feelings mm -hmm. and it's high and feelings are a creation of god actually mm. and if that if that is the case then god himself must also have feelings because otherwise he wouldn't be able to create some a, a creation with feelings mm. So, so you're saying that feelings are created by God or the capacity for feelings and emotions are created by I'm God? I'm not saying the actual feelings we feel are mm -hmm. created by God. I'm saying that the capacity to feel and the definition, the mathematical definition of feelings. Of the were, of distinct emotions of and distinct feelings. distinct emotions. Yeah. And, yeah. and there's hundreds of distinct emotions that yeah. a person can feel. Each yeah. one of them has a mathematical signature that God measures and, and God's laws measure. So yeah. the fact is that God must have the capacity to not only feel feelings, but also understands them so deeply that he can actually measure them. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and also sense them himself. Yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously God is a far more complex being than most people give God credit for. <laughs> uh, and I find that interesting in itself mm -hmm. too. We, you know, here we're considering an infinite being and from our finite mind, we're trying to, uh, you know, examine the, the qualities and, and content, if you like, of that in, infinite being. And, and we're not considering that that infinite being must have a superset of our emotions yeah. when it comes to our loving emotions. So, so, you know, God must be have a stronger feeling than we have when it comes to love. God must have a stronger feeling when it comes to you know, desire and passion and these kind of things yeah. than we have. Yeah. And that is the truth. The more, and that's true. The more you connect to God, the more you realize these particular things. Obviously, on, on Earth, people are very concerned about, uh, you know, their evil feelings, their, mm. their feelings that they know can be destructive. And, and so they would prefer to control those feelings mm. rather than to work through the reasons why they exist. Mm -hmm. And so they would rather feel that God has dealt with all that and therefore has no feelings and they yeah. would uh, to see that God actually has a pure set of loving feelings. Mm. Yeah. So uh, three things. Uh, first thing, um, you're really saying there in that point that people attribute emotion or they associate emotion and feeling with negative emotion and destructivity. And therefore they say, well, my concept of God is not, not an entity that's negative and destructive. So therefore God must be emotionless. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I've also heard other people say, um, well, because I have negative and positive emotions, God must have both negative and positive emotions. And we'll, t we'll discuss that in this section, won't exactly, we, the exactly. distinction. Yeah. Um, and the third clarifier is we're talking a lot about feelings and emotions, feelings and emotions. Is there really, a, are we just describing the, the same thing or do you make a distinction between the two? Well, you know, from our studies in the spirit world, we would normally dis make a distinction between these particular yeah. things, but where that for the sake of our discussions here on earth, we generally put them together. Yeah. The reason why we separated them in the spirit world in our discussions is because, you know, some of the feelings are what you would classify as sensory and yes. some of the feelings are emotional. So yeah. the sensory apparatus that exists in the soul, you know, th these are the senses like touch, taste and, mm -hmm. and those kind of senses produce feelings inside of the soul mm -hmm. and those are distinct and separate to the kinds of emotional responses we have to those feelings yeah. so so in the spirit world we would normally separate 
the word feelings from the word emotions. Mm -hmm. But we're here, here we are saying that God has both. God has sensory apparatus mm. to, to sense things mm -hmm. and, ha and obviously has an infinite capacity to sense things. Yet God can feel when the smallest creature and, and the smallest atom in his universe has shifted its place. Mm -hmm. So he, he is a ultra sensitive being when it comes to his sensory feelings. Mm -hmm. And then on, on the top of that, he is also an emotional being and, and has emotions and, and, and these emotions are, you know, projected at things and also can be received from things mm -hmm. in his creative universe. So, so God has both of those particular things. But what we're doing for the sake of this discussion is wrapping feelings and emotions all up together yeah. and calling them feelings and emotions or just feelings. You know? yeah, yeah, sure. OK. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, God has feelings and emotions. Let's talk about that because many people believe that God doesn't have feelings and emotions. So I'm going to ask you a question or a series of questions, and we've prepared some notes. Um, and what, what's the best thing to do is just to, I'll ask you the question, I'll read you some of what we've already prepared, and we can discuss that if you're happy with that mm. because that will, that will make sure that we kind of make it as succinct as possible. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and I'll try and take my time and sort of say things reasonably at a reasonable pace so that we're not overwhelming people. Sometimes yeah. we get a bit rapid fire, don't we? <laughs> we do, yeah. <laughs> Just we'll try to slow down yeah. for, your, for your sake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Does God have feelings and emotions? Or are you just making God into an anthropomorphic God by attributing emotions to God? Hmm. So I suppose the first thing we need to do here is discuss the word anthropomorphic, yeah. um, which, which is basically saying that we as humans have certain characteristics and attitudes and nature and emotions and certain feelings and so forth. We have sensory apparatus. And, and basically the question here is saying, well, are we trying to just attribute what we have to God yeah. or, or, you know, something different to that going mm -hmm. on? Are, are we trying to turn God into a human yeah. or are we actually looking at God's true nature or characteristics here? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's not a question that anyone who's actually connected to God really needs to be seriously concerned about because, you know, mm -hmm. when you connect to God that, yes, God does have emotions and feelings. And when you connect to God, you can feel those emotions and feelings. Mm -hmm. It's only a question that is usually raised by people who are not connected to God, mm -hmm. who, who feel that by attributing God emotion, we're basically saying that we're turning God into a human of some kind, mm -hmm. you know, or just something a bit better than a human. That's not the case at all. Uh, and this is something that we need to discuss uh, fairly, fairly clearly mm -hmm. with people to understand where human emotion comes from. It's, if we, if we if we are if, if we were saying or taking the approach if we think about it logically if we were taking the approach that God has a whole series of uh, uh, emotions mm -hmm. that we have uh, the the reality is we could be attributing to God things that we have because people do do that you know yeah. when it comes to God being wrathful for example yeah. people say well we're wrathful so surely God would be wrathful yeah. and there's an, there's a case where a human attributes a human emotion mm -hmm. to God so or even the idea of God as a man in the sky with a you know a long beard and and a, you know a staff and a throne that's really anthropomorphized anthropomorphic Emphasizing God, God. Yeah, if that's such yeah. a word, yeah. If that might have made that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, that's true, you know. So, so we've got. We, it is a valid question that we need to ask. Of course, from a logical perspective, we we must consider this thing, and that is that um, if we have emotions and God does not, mm -hmm. and emotions are a part of our happiness, mm -hmm. then we're basically saying that God doesn't have something that we have. Now. Mm -hmm. We're basically saying that an infinite being is more finite than we are. Mm. And, and that obviously logically does not make any sense from a purely philosophical point of view. Mm. And there you're not talking about a certain type of emotion. You're talking about the capacity for emotion. Exactly. Just because you've already to said there's certain emotions we have that God doesn't have. Well, there's certain um, emotions we create. Yes. Uh, yeah. Through certain choices and decisions we mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. that that God doesn't make those choices and decisions and those, therefore does not create the same emotion. Mm -hmm. 
God has the capacity to create such yes. such emotion in the sense of his soul would be able to, but he just doesn't make those choices because yeah. there's no need for him yeah. to make these particular choices and, and there's no desire in him to make the choice. Okay. The desire is a flawed human desire that we, you know, usually to avoid other deeper emotions and this creates other emotions. And these kind of emotions are things like fear and anger mm -hmm. and these kind of emotions, uh, you know, they're not necessary for the human to experience. Mm -hmm. Um, once we've released the causes, mm -hmm. but uh, unfortunately they are a part of the human experience that is removed from God. It's part of our human sin, actually, mm. and we need to start seeing it as such. But what I'm saying in this first argument is logically mm -hmm. and philosophically, if God is more limited than we are in any area of capacity, capacity yeah. then we're basically saying that God is a, is a less is a more finite being than we are. Yeah. Now, now, of course, that does not make any logical sense. If God exists at all, mm -hmm. God must be an infinite being or at least more b bigger than we are yeah. and therefore with a greater capacity to feel what we feel. Mm. Yeah. So, so it does not make any logical sense to believe that God is emotionless. Yeah. And in fact, we're not being logical at all when we say that. We are imposing some of our desires to be emotionless mm -hmm. ourselves onto God. Yes. And therefore, in that situation, we are anthropomorphizing, if that <laughs> yeah. is such a word. We are turning God into an anthropomorphic God yes. um, by attributing to God uh, feelings that we do not wish to experience. And we're basically saying that God doesn't wish to experience them either. Yeah. <laughs> does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. It does. Um, so, so the irony of the question is that many people who ask this question are actually, by asking the question, trying to turn God into yeah. uh, a human rather yeah. than God being something that, something that is larger and, 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 and infinite. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? That, I mean, we are so inherent, we cannot, much as many humans try, we cannot actually remove emotion from our existence from no. ourselves it's no. we are inherently emotional beings and in fact the desire to remove emotion from our existence causes all, most of our disease and sicknesses and all, all of our suffering <laughs> yes so, and so, suffering for others exactly yeah. so god wouldn't choose that mm. god knows better than that god, yeah. god knows that if he decided to suppress some of his emotion <laughs> yeah. there'd be a lot of suffering created yeah. not just only for him but also for everyone else so you so god doesn't choose to do those particular mm -hmm. things although god has the capacity to experience any emotion yes mm. yeah yeah fascinating anyway let will i start to read our yeah, response I think so. I think yeah so, yeah. so the reminder again the question does god have feelings and emotions or are you just making god into an anthropomorphic god by attributing emotions to god mm. so we said since our soul is made in the image of God, the human soul has a subset of the capacities and qualities of God's soul. Since emotions are a part of God's soul, or you could say that um, emotions are perfected in God, it's natural for humans to have a subset of God's soul qualities. Mm. So it's really not a case of us anthropomorphizing God. It's saying, no, my experience is such, therefore my creator must have the same... Have a superset. A superset of that experience. Yes. Yeah. It's basically saying, and what it's basically saying from God's perspective, is that God, having, the, uh, having an infinite being, an infinite being, has the capacity to put into a finite being some of the mm -hmm. infinite qualities that God has. Mm. So, so while they not, won't be in an infinite way, mm -hmm. they, some of the qualities, some of the nature of God's soul is actually being placed by God as a part of the design of the human soul into the human soul. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're not actually God, we're not anthropomorphizing God. Yeah. What we're doing is we're saying God created the human. Yeah. And in creating the human, God decided to put a part of his qualities. Mm -hmm. we're, we're actually saying that the human comes from a divine creation. Yeah. And, and therefore God put some of his personal qualities, including the ability to experience emotion, the ability to sense things through mm -hmm. sensory apparatus and so forth, these particular things were put into the human soul and also into the each appendage of the human soul to a subset. Mm. And what we're saying there is the human soul has a fairly complete experience of, of a lot of God's qualities, not, not to an infinite degree, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, a, but a subset of God's qualities. Mm -hmm. And then we're saying that the spirit body has a subset of the soul's qualities mm -hmm. and the and the physical body has a subset of the spirit body's quali yeah. qualities. Yeah. 
And this uh, has been specifically designed this way so the human is capable of growth. Yeah. And, we, and with all growth, we need to start off in a small mat way, you know, and mm -hmm. we think about a baby when it's growing. Obviously, it begins with just a sperm and an egg cell, and then it begins to multiply, multiply, multiply. Divine. And from the genetic yeah. code, from the laws that govern the genetic code, splits into the different functionalities of the different parts of the body, for example. Yeah. And these particular things illustrate that, that actually God created the capacity for, for this growth to occur inside the body and inside both bodies, in fact, the spirit body as well. And then, of, of course, this same capacity for growth must exist inside the soul mm -hmm. as well. And, and God did it this way so that we would have the capacity for slow, absorbing type of growth instead of us being confronted with all of the possibilities of the universe which would be very scary uh, probably but also mm. very difficult to mm. absorb god created us with the capacity to absorb it at our own under at the rate of our own control mm. and this is a beautiful thing god has done it's a very loving thing to do and uh, and what it does is it gives us then the capacity to desire growth and desire new knowledge and to be what we would call self-responsible and also free thinking beings you know people who can think for themselves and so it's a very loving thing what god has done but but we must must consider that anything that exists in the human body any capacity that exists in the spirit body and any capacity that exists in the human soul must all be a subset of things that God can do. Mm. And, and they are, in mm -hmm. fact, a subset of the things God can do. Mm. So, so God's not limited by any of these things. We are the ones with the limit and we are the ones with the subset capacity of what God can do. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I'll keep reading a lot of what we've written. You've just um, yeah. iterated. So yeah. I'll, just, I'll just read it and it, just interject if you want to add sure. anything. Rather than making God into an anthropomorphic God, we're stating the truth about how human beings have the ability to have emotions. God made humans to become like God in that humans have the capacity to have similar qualities in their soul to what God has. Since emotions are a part of God's soul, God, by making humans in God's image, God gave the human qualities that are God-like, mm. which is amazing, isn't it? Mm. The, the capacity to have emotions is God-like. Like, yeah, but even the capacity to be a, a being that thinks for itself. No, mm. no other creation does this. No other creation has the capacity to analyze, to philosophize, or any of these kind of things. Mm -hmm. These are all qualities that exist in God, and God developed them in the human. And it's, it's quite amazing when you think about it, yeah. that God developed a lot of these, what I would classify as almost God-like qualities yeah. in the human itself, but called it a special creation, you know, the, the most unique yeah. of all of his creations. Yeah, and, yeah. and it makes me think, and we'll talk a bit more about this later in the discussion, but... I was just preparing some other material that we're doing a discussion about religion and atheism. And, mm. and part of that is responding to some comments by Richard Dawkins. And I was just it's marvelling really at even the capacity to reason against the existence of God. That's a capacity that God granted us, the, mm. the, the mm. capacity to really reason and, you know, have all these ideas that are actually contrary to God. Yeah. It's an amazing gift, really, yeah. isn't it? What yeah. kind of parent gives a child that kind of freedom and, and desires for the child? Yeah, like to... the capacity to rebel against themselves. Yeah, you know, like, yeah that's yeah. what God has done. He's given the human the capacity to even, even deny God's existence completely yeah. if that's what the human yeah. wishes to do. And also to go on a journey of deep questioning, to even to visit places where we deny God's existence and then end up back almost um, feeling quite connected to God. If, That's right. That we have all of those capacities, you know, to, yeah. to change and grow and change our opinions and have different experiences. It's like an incredible... Yeah, and we've recently spoken to spirits who, you know, who were like 1,500 years in the denial of God. They're in the sixth sphere. Um, and, you know, for the first time in their life, contemplated yeah. the logic of denying God. Yeah. You know, that there's, a whole, there's a whole heap of things that are worth considering in that discussion even. Yes. So, yeah, the, the, you know, this whole process is important to understand that, that if God does exist at all, then we have a subset of God's capacities, uh, not that God is limited in ways that we are not. Yes. You know, it makes yeah. no logical sense to consider that God is limited in ways that we are not mm. limited. 
I think it demonstrates how confused we are as, you know, humanity itself is very confused and conflicted about emotional experience, isn't it? It's yes. you, this kind of clarity that you have about emotions and how it all works and comes from an acceptance of your own emotional experience. Mm -hmm. And then that acceptance of your emotional experience has really enabled you to have this connection with God, which then enables you to be so, you know, clear and, and um, sure about what we're discussing. So even though we're discussing this in a very intellectual fashion, mm -hmm. anyone can come to understand this if they do those two steps that you did. Yes, everyone who connects to God, you know, in a proper, you know, proper way, using the conscience and the, you know, connection by the Holy Spirit to receive mm -hmm. God's love, will come to the conclusion that God is an emotional being, mm -hmm. and and all we're doing in this discussion is really is helping those people who are not yet connected to God to realise that God is an emotional being, yeah, because those who uh, are connected to God already know that, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 All right, so I'll keep going. Uh, in fact. If the human soul receives God's love, the human has the capacity to become at one with God in emotion. Mm. Mm. So in when, other words, the human has the capacity for God to transmit an emotion and the human has the capacity to receive it and, and, uh, and feel it like a, as God would be feeling it. Yeah. You know, so, you know, that, that's a remarkable capacity of the human soul. That is, a, uh, that is an extension of the, the human soul's design. Yeah. That, that only can be uh, embraced if you receive God's love. Yeah. yeah. It's like a capacity, a dormant capacity that only... A potential. A potential that becomes uh, enabled when you receive God's love mm. and continue to receive it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. When humans restrict emotion, we enter a state of fear and therefore create unloving emotions such as anger, rage, resentment and hatred in order to suppress our fear. But even when we have released all such expressions of fear and we return to our natural state, the human capacity to feel emotions is still limited since humans do not receive God's love. Humans who do not receive God's love do not have the capacity to grow towards the infinite expression of emotion. Mm. I feel this is a very important thing that most people who are listening still don't really understand, and that is emotions are a good thing, and to become mm. more and more sensitive to them is a good thing. Mm. And, and that God herself desires us to grow towards the infinite expression of emotion, but because we have removed uh, the restriction of emotion, we have no, we're no longer in a state of fear. It's the restriction of emotion that causes the state of fear. Mm. And, and, you know, oftentimes it's the, you know, we've talked in some of our assistance groups, for example, about the global blockages surrounding, you know, emotion. Yes. And, and, and the fear of emotion being yeah. one of our, you know, major, and in fact, the major blockage to our experience of growth. And, and experience of self. Really. And experience of self yeah. and, ex and experience of God, actually, too. And, and so, you know, we need to understand that God is not so restricted. Mm. God does not believe in the restriction of God's emotions. God, <laughs> yeah. God, God is always fully expressive. Mm -hmm. God never restricts God's expression. And, and there's good reasons for that, because if God did restrict it, he, he may, in fact, potentially create these emotions of, that, that are based around fears. Now, uh, you know, that would be ludicrous given the fact that he's created all things anyway. Mm. He has nothing to fear. Mm -hmm. so, so therefore, he has nothing to restrict. Yeah. Um, we uh, also, ironically, have nothing to fear, but we believe we do. Yes. And this is a, this is a, you know, so, so it's a state of illusion mm. that we're living in, that God is trying to help us get out of mm. as a human race. And, and it's this state of illusion where we believe in fear that creates all the emotions that, like rage, as I mentioned there, resentment, anger, hatred. And these particular emotions are the destructive emotions that cause a lot of pain and suffering on the planet and also personal pain and suffering inside the bodies of the person themselves. Yeah. Now, God is not so restricted. And so God does not restrict God's emotion. God does not, therefore, create any of these emotions that humans create. So, so the emotions of rage, you know, resentment, hatred, these are human creations. Mm. They're not God's creation. And they don't exist in God, but only because God doesn't deny his emotional expression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so because God chooses not to deny God's uh, personal emotional expression, God has no need to experience these particular emotions. And we have no need to experience them either. Yeah. 
unless we restrict our personal emotional expression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. But okay. even given all of that, even if, if we don't receive God's love, we, we are only ever going to have a finite expression of emotion. Yeah. And, and that's something that we need to understand. We're not really anthropomorphizing God. Yeah. What we're doing is we're actually saying that we have the capacity in the normal human state to be a subset of God's sensory and emotional capacity. Mm -hmm. in, other, in that way, we're sort of God-like or made in God's image. Mm -hmm. And then when we receive some of God's emotion, God's love in particular, our soul can be transformed into experiencing deeper and deeper amounts of emotion and therefore it is approaching the infinite with the capacity to experience emotion. Yes. Mm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, and I think, I think our last paragraph says exactly that. God's natural state is the infinite expression of loving emotion. God does not suppress emotion, and so God does not create any unloving emotion. Yeah, and it's important we, there, I think, that we say that, that God's natural state is the infinite expression of all loving emotion. Yeah. Um, God uh, does not, uh, you know, because God has this infinite capacity to experience emotion, he can experience emotion all at the same time, all mm. loving emotions all at the same time. Mm. So, so, for example, ha a feeling of uh, just feeling of love and a feeling of compassion, they are a bit different feelings. Compassion is about, you know, our circumstance or situation. Yeah. God if, feels these feelings in an infinite degree all the time. Mm. It's not, he doesn't do what we do. And what we do generally is we turn it off some days, turn it on other days, turn it on one hour, turn it off the next hour, that kind of thing. God doesn't do that. God is the constant infinite expression of all loving emotion. Mm. And, and once you connect more and more with God, you realise that, this constancy the, of God's experience of emotion is what is make what makes the universe completely safe. Because yeah. if, if God was not constant in the expression of all of God's loving emotions, mm. this would then create a time when God, you know, when the, the universe itself would be, uh, uh, you know, would be without some kind of God's emotion. Mm. Which, which would be terrible for the universe itself. Cause it, because you're saying the emotion itself almost sustains the universe. It does. God's yeah. loving emotions are what sustain the actual universe itself. Mm. Remember, emotion is energy in motion. Yeah. So, so God's energies in motion are what sustains the motion of the universe. Mm. Without God's energies being in motion, then the parts of the universe would immediately no longer be able to be sustained. Yeah. So, so God having emotion is essential for the very existence of the universe and the very existence of the human soul. If God did not have emotion, the human soul could not exist and the universe itself could not exist. That's how important emotion, mm. God's emotion is mm. to the survival of the universe. And most people don't think about that very logically. Mm. So, you know, I feel that's a very important mm. thing to state. Yeah, mm. very important. Mm. And it's interesting, you mentioned that God's emotion generates the safety, really, the predictability of what we live in. Yes. And... It's, it governs the law of permanence. Yes. You know, without God permanently and, and constantly experiencing these emotions and sharing these emotions with God's creations, mm. God's creations would at times be completely... Uh, without these particular emotions, mm. these energies that are in motion, and and uh, the universe would greatly feel the effects of that particular problem. Mm. So, so God's not, um, you know, like I, I feel people need to come to understand the importance of God's emotion to their very existence. Yes. Let alone, uh, you know, their connection with God personally. Mm. So, you know, the universe itself and the human soul itself would not exist without God's emotion. Mm. And, and in fact, the very laws that govern the universe could not exist without God's emotion enforcing them. Mm. So, so, you know, these are, these are all very important things to understand. Yeah, and I often find myself thinking of the analogies to our own existence. You know, our soul is really what sustains our bodies. And without the flow, of the acceptance and flow of all emotions within the soul, our bodies suffer and um, and also our environment becomes less safe for, right. for ourselves and for others. And this is quite, it's quite amazing, isn't it? The That's way right. that 
the same laws are governing everything so it makes sense mm. that there is that permanence even on a micro scale and a macro scale that's right yeah. god you know god created us in god's image for a number of reasons and one of those reasons was to teach us about god mm. and obviously when our physical body suffers because we uh, stop the flow of emotion in our soul we're basically seeing a principle that the universe will suffer if God stopped the flow of emotion <laughs> in God's soul. Yeah. So, you know, we, we can easily see from these particular things that obviously God has these capacities to a more infinite degree. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and when I say more infinite, to an infinite degree, mm. there's no such thing as really more, more infinite. infinite but, yeah. but, you know, we need to, we need to see that, um, that this is the truth of the way the universe operates. And this is what I notice is very difficult for most people to cope with. They are still very stuck on the fact that emotions are something that need to be felt 24 by 7 every moment of every day. Yeah. You know, there's this still a strong desire to turn off emotion at particular times, yeah. not understanding the terrible effects that that has upon our body, our happiness and, and, and our pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. It obviously increases our pain and suffering. And, and obviously uh, severely limits our joys and mm. our happiness. So, so it's a very important thing to understand this principle that God has this flow of emotion for this reason mm -hmm. and that we ourselves, if we, if we are made in God's image, we've been designed, our soul has been designed to have a flow of emotion. And if yeah. we stop it, yeah. we're going to have some very negative effects. Now, if God attempted to stop God's flow of emotion, there would be some major negative effects on the universe itself in fact, the universe would probably collapse, yeah. but, but the reality is God sustains these particular feelings that God has. And we can also flip that, like, because I often think like you were saying, God made us in his image so we could learn about God. But I also think like, well, God was onto something. He knows what works. Why wouldn't he make all his creations in the same way that things work for him or, you know, her, however, you, both. But, um, uh, if if I think about how the creative capacity of God, this being who allows all loving emotion to its full extent at all moments, and the if you consider it's mind boggling, but you consider that such a being created the universe that we live in, and mm -hmm. each of us as unique individual souls, that's an immense creative power that mm -hmm. we can't really properly conceive. Mm -hmm. But we could say, well, if I did that. If I am allowed all positive emotion within my own soul um, all, the time. all of the time, what kind of creative capacity would I have? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it gives you some idea of the capacity of the human soul if emotion was allowed to flow. And we had also removed from ourselves every unloving emotion. Yeah. And, and, and then you can have some concept of what the capacity of the soul would be. Mm. But, but because we're so limited with this idea of emotion, and we're frequently trying to shut down our own emotion. Mm. Unfor unfortunately, what we're trying to do is turn God into even a more limited creature than what we are yeah. by saying that God actually does the same thing. Yeah. And God doesn't. Yeah. yeah, God never does. All right, let's <laughs> let's go. Let's. I'll just read. I think we've now mm -hmm. fully covered it. But yeah. We've not made God into an anthropomorphic God by attributing emotions to God. But rather, God made humans to be God-like and therefore made humans to express and experience emotion just like God expresses and experiences emotion. Yes. Emotion including desires, passion, creation, sexual expression, intention and all loving emotions flow within God's soul to an infinite capacity. Mm. Yeah. And, and so, you know, now that we've say, sort of tried to establish, well, God has emotions and feelings. Yes. And you can see here, basically what we're saying is God has an infinite amount of it, all, love, all loving expression of all emotions and mm -hmm. feelings. God also has an infinite sensory apparatus mm. as well. So, so when I talk about a sensory apparatus, if you think about senses, our thought, you know, we're, we're thought to have had in the physical form five senses primarily. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's more, but... Uh, you know, we just don't develop them generally because mm -hmm. these are the ones we feel most dominantly. But if you look at the f senses of taste, touch, and, you know, hearing mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth, these kind of senses, uh, God also has these kind of senses. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, God can't make an apple taste like an apple without knowing what an apple tastes like. Mm -hmm. You know, God can't make an orange taste like an orange without knowing what an orange tastes like. So, so you know, God has these sensory apparatuses as well 
which we classify in the spirit world as feelings, sensory feelings. Mm. Uh, and also God has the infinite expression of emotion as well. Yeah. So, so, you know, you can't design something for the human knowing what it's going to taste like for the human without you knowing what it tastes like. And also understanding the human sensory apparatus to understand what it's going to taste like for them. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense if you think about it that God must have an infinite awareness of all these sensory apparatus that God has also created for, mm. for humans to experience. And God also ha has an infinite awareness of all the human emotion. Yeah. God also knows when you're angry, he can measure that. He, he just doesn't feel angry himself, that's all. Mm. He can feel your anger because he knows how it's the signature of it. He, 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 he created its capacity to be experienced mm. by giving you free will to deny your emotion. Yeah. That's how he created the capacity to experience it. But he didn't. He doesn't create the emotion itself. You mm. did, um, and and we've got to see what parts of this are human creations and what parts are God creations. But yeah. from God's perspective, this sensory apparatus, the feelings and the emotions, are all expressed and experienced constantly to an infinite degree. And we need to understand that, even intellectually understand that about God, before we can proceed to have a relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty amazing, isn't it? I love my pink lady apples. It's just the <laughs> texture and the, the taste, taste and the juiciness, the yeah. crisp, everything you get when you bite into like a really fresh apple. It's apple season. Mm. And it's like, it's very beautiful to think that God created that experience with a full knowledge of that. You know, what an incredible sensory experience that could be for me. Yes, yeah. if, you, if you think about this, just the sensory apparatus itself without the emotion, because yeah. the sensory apparatus, the feelings, do create emotions. Yeah. And, but if you look at the sensory apparatus just by itself, mm. it, it's an incredible concept to actually design within the human the capacity to taste certain tastes mm. and, and to smell certain smells. Smell, taste, right. feel a, that uh, result um, in a sense of the, the, the juice Flow, you know, like all kinds of things in that, that one. results in joy, happiness, yeah. and and wonder. Yeah. In our experience, you know, what, yeah. why do you get up? Why, why do people get up in the morning and have a cup of coffee? In the Western world, it happens yeah. a lot because they like the smell of it and the yeah. and, 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 and the, the taste, taste of it and, and the so feel forth, of you know? the warmth in there. There's stomach. a whole heap of things yeah. that have been designed there, you know, yeah. and. And and while coffee is probably not that good for a person's body <laughs> at the end of the day, because all of their it's, emotions, all their emotions because yeah. of caffeine and so forth, at the end of the day they love it because the sensory apparatus is there. They couldn't even love something that's not good for them without yeah. the sensory apparatus. You know, God could have designed it so that if you have alcohol, it tastes terrible. Yeah. <laughs> he could have designed it that way, and well, it does. in some ways it does. <laughs> right? But but he could have designed it in such a way that it tastes so bad that you you, yeah. you know, it's like drinking you know petrol or some yes. other substance that you. You'd have to have to spit out of your body, yeah. but he didn't. He, he gave you the capacity even mm. to to damage your body if you decided to choose to with what seems to be nice tasting things. Yeah, um, and he did. And he did this because he loves you and cares about mm. you and wants you to go through the experience and work out what's good for you and what isn't mm. and things like that without mm. it being of major danger to your life every mm. time you do it. You mm. know, so so you know God's done a lot of wonder, wonderful things when it comes to the human body and the creations that are there to sustain the human body yeah. in order for us to enjoy our life and our experience. And, yeah. and so, you know, these are just expressions of God's emotion for us, mm. you know. And, and expressions of God's capacity to, a, we have it to a more finite degree. Yes, you know, uh, like if someone, uh, you know, nowadays there are scientists who are able to sort of analyze the, uh, like the capacity or the, the, the content, if you like, the chemical content of an apple, yeah. and to sort of synthesize mm -hmm. a similar tasting thing, yeah. right? But it's taking millennia for humans to get to that capacity. Yeah. Obviously, this is something God does all the time, you yeah. know, because it, because it, you know, He's created all these things. Yeah. So, so in, an, in it, it's infinite. If you think about yeah. the different tastes of fruit, just on its own, on its own, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. So, sorry, I interrupted and, you. you know, the the beauty of of what God has done here is is not only is God showing us that He created these things for our joy, which is mm. about God loving us, mm. but but also God has done it because God can. Yeah. You know, so this tells us that God has the capacity to understand these things. He has the capacity to synthesize these mm -hmm. things, to create these things, mm -hmm. and, and His capacity, of course, is has that capacity to an infinite degree. Mm -hmm. So, so we need to start seeing that God has this sensory capacity to an infinite degree, 
God has the emotional capacity to an infinite degree. Mm-hmm. God has the intellectual capacity to an infinite degree. Mm-hmm. And God has the you know, capacity to experience all of these different things to an infinite degree. We are finite beings, finite mm-hmm. creations. We experience them in a finite way. And God doesn't restrict the experience of them for God. No. He allows the human to restrict their own experience, mm-hmm. but he does not make the same mistake yeah. of restricting his own experience. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's very important that we understand that God is a feeling and emotional being. Yes. And to an infinite degree. Excellent. And that sets us up for our next series of questions. Yeah. 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 How God feels about humans collectively. Mm. So let's now talk. We've just established that God definitely has feelings. Mm. And emotions. (laughs) And emotions. Mm. Um, But many people don't feel themselves that God has any care or regard for humanity. Mm. For Uh, the human race. Collectively, you Mm. know. Uh, uh, there's a common feeling that God doesn't really care about what's happening on earth and if God did, God would do some different things. Yeah, there's a common feeling that uh, God would, you know, do something about human pain and suffering if God actually Mm. cared. And, uh, you know, obviously there's not a deep understanding about reasons why God wouldn't do that. But, um, you know, obviously it's something we do need to discuss uh, Mm. because we we do need to talk about whether God does feel about humans and how God feels about humans collectively. <laughs> yeah, well, let's let's ask the question. Does mm. God have feelings and emotions about humans collectively or does God not care at all? Well, yeah, and, and the answer to that question is quite clear. That God, there's an infinite amount of evidence, in fact, <laughs> that God cares about the human soul, the human human beings collectively. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's so, there's so much evidence that you know, we've, we're only going to have the capacity to in the course of our discussion today, just lift, you know, 10 or 12 of them. But but the reality is, there's just huge amounts of evidence for the fact that God does care. Yep. It's just that humans generally ignore that evidence yes. uh, in preference to, you know, s- seeing other things that they feel God is doing when, when reality, and in, and in most cases, what humans are doing are attributing their creations to God, yeah. which, which is something that obviously is not very logical to do, but it's something that we do in our desire to deny our responsibilities. Yeah, to avoid self-responsibility, which yeah. is something we talked about at length in the third assistance group in 2016. That's right, yeah. 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 All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of that evidence mm-hmm. that we've noted down. I'll read out points and you can discuss them. So some of the evidence includes, but it's not limited to, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that God designed the laws that govern the universe and the universe itself <laughs> only to support the life, happiness, development and growth of the human. So there we're saying the laws and the universe itself supports every good thing. It's not, it's, it's not even, even like that. It's, it's bigger than that. Mm-hmm. The reality is that God does not need the universe in order to enjoy life. Mm. God created the universe in order for human soul to enjoy life. Mm. So the whole universe itself and all of the laws that govern the universe itself have been created specifically for the human soul to enjoy life. Mm. So that surely that demonstrates a lot of care for the human soul. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's true, just as you said earlier, most humans don't enjoy life. And then they blame God for that rather than seeing that, that there's laws operating to actually bring them into a, a completely fulfilled, fulfilling life exactly. if they change their, the way they use their will and desire. Yes. Yeah. So, so this is a very important thing to remember that the entire universe itself mm. and the laws that govern it have been designed specifically for the human soul. Mm. For, the, for the happiness and welfare and growth of the human soul. Yeah, yeah. No other reason. God, yeah. not, God doesn't have a personal reason for creating the universe, mm. aside from the reason being that God wanted to create humans and, and give humans the capacity to experience an almost infinite universe. Yeah. So, so that, you know, that's why God created the universe like God did. Mm. And that's the only reason why. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Right. Well, further to that, um, not only did God do that, but God actually designed the universe to allow humans to have the ability to receive God's love personally, a personal yeah. connection to God and so, to be transformed by that process. Yes. Yeah. So here, here we need to see that 
that God, who obviously doesn't need the universe to exist, means that God uh, existed before the universe existed. Mm -hmm. Therefore, God exists outside of the universe. Or you could, in, in some cases, say, because God is infinite and the universe itself is not, mm -hmm. God actually exists containing the universe. But, but it, when you think about that, God has allowed God's emotions to enter the universe itself mm -hmm. and permeate the very creations of the universe mm -hmm. itself, of which the human soul is the highest creation. Mm -hmm. So so the fact that God allowed that to happen and designed everything for that to happen indicates his love and care for the human soul. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. I, I always think of like when you talk about um, us being contained within God, like we're like God's microbiome. Yeah. <laughs> we have to love our microbiome because yeah, God's yeah, loving our, in, a, in our yeah, guts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Mm. Um, God also designed the laws of the universe to ensure that the human soul cannot self-destruct and cannot irreparably damage other human souls or the universe itself. Yeah, so this is, a, I feel, a big expression of God's love. He, he designed the universe itself and the laws that govern the universe in such a way that we, we even though we've got free will, we can't completely self-destruct. Mm. You know, it, it, given the human capacity for self-annihilation, you could see that, you know, if God didn't place these particular limits on the human soul, there is a possibility the human soul could make choices that cause its own destruction mm. to, to a complete degree. Mm. And, and God uh, placed limits upon that because God didn't want the, any of his human soul, his highest creation, his human soul creations, to actually self-destruct, mm. you know, in the long run. So, so this demonstrates that God had a loving intention as well. He didn't design something that was fundamentally flawed mm. uh, because if he had designed the human soul able to self-destruct, he would have designed the human soul with a fundamental flaw. Mm. And he hasn't done that. He's, he, he's done, in fact, quite the opposite of that. He's designed the human soul and the laws that govern the human soul to enable the human soul to engage a lot of very selfish and unloving behavior, but never completely self-destruct mm. and also never completely destroy another human. Mm. So even though you might destroy the physical body of another human you know, through murder or some other a war or some other action, you can't, you can't destroy the spirit or the soul of mm. the human. And so, you know, this is a great thing that God has done as well, limiting the capacity of us to, no matter how evil or intensively evil we become, we, we can't harm another person to the degree that they no longer exist mm. and, well, and that, and they, that can't they can't recover. recover. Yeah. So, so these are all very great uh, designs that God placed in the human soul, obviously demonstrating a huge amount of care for us as individuals and collectively. Mm. 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 Yeah, amazing. Mm. Okay, uh, also God designed the human soul itself to ensure that humans have the ability to grow beyond their original design criteria, to become a new creature and to become immortal. Yeah, so um, this is in, in itself again activated by choice. So, so God here is a deep respecter of the will that he's given to us as humans. So, mm -hmm. so he, he doesn't give us a gift such as the gift of will only to then deny its operation. Uh, and here, we, here what we're seeing is that God has said, right, I'm giving you this gift of will, but you can engage this gift of will to such an extent that you can receive a part of what I am and become a new creature mm -hmm. and therefore also be conscious of your own immortality, mm -hmm. to be conscious that you're never going to die or can never be harmed to the soul level, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a great uh, design feature mm -hmm. of the human mm -hmm. soul and demonstrates a lot of love too. He could have not shared himself yeah. or chosen to not share himself and still have created a fairly remarkable creature. Mm -hmm. You know, e every person in the sixth dimension is in that state where they haven't experienced it a part of God's nature and, and they're very remarkable being people yeah. as a result of their growth and they have a lot of happiness as a result of their growth. He could have designed us with that fundamental limitation but mm. he didn't. Mm. He, he gave us this ability to even go beyond that mm -hmm. uh, but obviously based upon our choice. So that, that's a great expression of God's love in itself. Yeah. And then also this subsequent result of that is to become immortal, the consciousness of your own uh, inability to ever die or ever or ever be disintegrated mm. ever again mm. is such a is su is such a satisfying emotion because because it as you can see it gets rid of all any concept of uh, fear or or, or uh, dis destabilization of yeah. your of your own life 
and, and and that in itself is another wonderful gift that God gave, which He wouldn't have done if He didn't really care very much about us. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Uh, God created the human soul itself and its possible appendages, appendages such as the spiritual and physical bodies, with sensory apparatus that allow the soul to have experiences which it retains and remembers and to make self-actualized decisions and choices. Mm. So when, when you, this is, a, I think, a very a strong indication of God's love for humanity. He, you know, if you think about the, like we were talking just earlier in, an, in the previous section about, you know, just being able to taste an apple mm. and, the, and the unique tastes of different food, for mm. example. And food is such an immense uh, privilege for most people on the planet. In yeah. fact, some, one of the only privileges that many people on the planet mm. experience. Mm. And, and, and it, the beautiful flavours that you can experience in that. Now, if God didn't care about humanity, he, he might have made one or two flavours or none at all, <laughs> yeah, even. Because yeah. we don't need flavour in order to exist, but yeah. we do need flavour in order to experience joy and happiness. Yes. So this is an indication that he is concerned about our joy and mm. happiness. Now, when you look at other sensory apparatus, like our sexual senses and mm. so forth, no, every poor person and every rich person has <laughs> the same senses, you know. So, so, you know, God also made these senses uh, that irrespective of the individual and their, and their personal capacities or their personal yeah. intellectual capacities even. Yeah. So this is an indication that God wants every person to enjoy those particular things, not, mm. not just a few people. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we get, and when we look at every sensory apparatus, not, notwithstanding the emotions, yeah. but every sensory apparatus, every single one of them created so that we can understand our limits, but also experience a lot of joy mm -hmm. and, and also make decisions based upon our enjoyment of those particular things. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you've mentioned in that point. I mean, mm. you're talking about the sensory apparatus, but also the fact that we can retain and remember experiences. That in itself is a capacity. It's not well understood how that happens for other creations, mm. but there's some evidence that there is some retention and memory. But our memory is intricate and, and also we can make as you said, self-actualized decisions and choices based not only mm. on the, the situation right now, but we can reason and also take into account past experiences mm. and um, make comparisons. And it just it's a very complex thing that each of us is doing all of the time. Yes, it's an extension. Uh, you know, when we compare the animal nature of an animal or the animal nature of a human, yeah. we can see that there are certain learning functions that are available which are necessary for, for survival. survival. Yeah. But, but the God created the human soul beyond these capacities, mm. the ability to make decisions based on love rather than survival mm -hmm. and to make decisions based on philosophy rather than survival mm -hmm. and so forth. So, you know, the reality is that, that the human soul has been created with far more capacity than what any animal type of thing has been created as a capacity. So, mm -hmm. so you know, this is an indication how much God loves his highest creation yeah. and wants God, the highest creation to experience many of the things that he experiences. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, God created the human soul itself to share in the joy of creation. Yeah. So, so you know, when I say share in the joy of creation, you see an animal can have a, have a baby, but, mm -hmm. but an animal doesn't experience the joy of it. Mm. An animal is not self-actualized being. It can't mm. reason, it can't philosophize, it can't mm. you know, understand itself or understand other creations. And, and so you know, it, it, it is only happening in an instinctual way. Whereas yeah. for the human, there's, a, there's not only the instinctual way of, of, of procreation, but there's also the joy and happiness that comes yeah. through the experience of procreation so and the capacity and the, to reflect and to on existence uh, yeah to learn and experience yeah. through emotion and reason it's yes. a whole different uh, yeah. set of yeah this is a unique capacity and yeah. obviously a demonstration of god's love for humanity yeah mm. yeah god created all lower creations to support and enhance the human experience what do you yes. mean by that well if you think about it god could have created the universe could have created the human soul but have there's no animals and mm. there's no plants and there's mm. no because he could have created us without the need to integrate with these particular things if he so desired mm. but he, he wanted us to experience a complete sort of experience with 
wonders and joys in every mm. area that we could look at. Mm. And, and many people on this planet today experience the joy of looking in uh, and examining, you know, science and other things in all sorts of areas of life. And everyone is able to choose what area of life is their is their you know greatest joy, mm -hmm. and and if God hadn't designed the the universe the way God had designed it, we wouldn't have this ability to experience the wonder of finding you know amazing things about all sorts of different aspects of our existence yeah. and you know the fact that god has done that demonstrates that god wants us to experience joy and wonder constantly mm. joy and wonder wonder itself is an interesting emotion yeah and and you, without wonder a lot of the joys of our life would be diminished and so you know the, these are things that god has done to enhance the human experience now if God didn't care about humanity, would he have bothered enhancing the human experience? Yeah, Probably not, right? Probably not. <laughs> because wonder in itself, um, it's not an emotion. It's not something that's necessary to even... It comes as the result of discovery. It's not something that it necessarily propels us towards discovery. Which, and it's not necessary for survival. That's what I mean. Like those. Usually discovery is important for survival. But yeah. wonder itself, that's a whole emotion that just comes like... Mm. I discovered something or I see something and it's just invoking. Like, how do you describe the experience of wonder? It's, exactly. There are so many emotions that you can see would be unnecessary to survival, yeah. but not unnecessary to happiness or joy. Yes. So, so, you know, God's created us with the capacity to experience these particular emotions that are not just necessary for survival, mm. just like an animal feels necessity for survival, but rather so that we can experience joy and, yeah. and growth in our life. So, you know, the fact that God has done that demonstrates mm -hmm. his amount of care in our design. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we're talking about how God feels about humans collectively. And, mm. and like, obviously, there's a lot of love there, isn't yes. there? Yes. Yeah. A lot yeah. of interest in our personal experience of happiness and joy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, God ensured that when the human attempts to damage itself, even to the point of death of the physical body, the human continues to live, having an even more enhanced experience. Yes, and isn't that a remarkable thing? It's like we get the first uh, part of our existence, which is uh, the human part of our existence. We take actions which are a lot to do with the suppression of emotion. So we try to suppress our emotions and to suppress our feelings. The effort to do that creates this disease and suffering, and eventually we die from what we call old age, but it is really a subtotal of all, a sum total of all of our decision making that we've done out of harmony with love towards ourselves mm. that creates our physical body's inability to continue to replicate itself. Mm. So we die. We die, and, uh, and instead of you know, a parent under those circumstances, I gave you this wonderful gift and you just ruined it. Instead of uh, making the next life better, I'm going to make the next life worse for you, <laughs> you know, which is what the concept of hell really is, right? Yes. The, the Christian concept of hell really is. But that's not what God has done. What God's done is made the next life a more enhanced experience. Mm. And, and even if we are in the hell of the spirit world in terms of in a dark, uh, dark incapacity, we have the ability to grow into an enhanced experience from mm. that particular point that mm. we've created for ourselves. And the beauty, the beauty of that experience is that that means that God has, meant, God has designed us in such a way that we can't to so totally self-destruct mm. that we no longer exist. But also God doesn't have this underlying fundamental belief that we should be punished for all the bad things we did. He just wants correction. Yeah. And, and we can see this in the design. Mm. The, the reality is he could have made, made our next life uh, much more difficult than this one yeah. based upon our choices if he wanted yeah. to, but he didn't. Mm. He, he's tried to make it even more uh, connected to the sensory and emotional part of ourselves so that we can actually grow more rapidly. Yeah. And in fact, many people after they pass start to grow far more rapidly than they ever did on earth mm. so so this is this is a part of the enhanced experience that god provided after we pass that's right because it's not necessarily um um an improvement in the classical sense but it's we have as soon as we pass we're more connected to those spirit body senses mm. so there's an an enhanced a greater experience of everything which then because of the operation of the law and everything we've discussed in this series enables us to grow more rapidly That's and right. so 
everything's designed for our continual improvement and growth, isn't it? Yeah. That's right. So, so the beauty of that is that it demonstrates how much God cares for us, even when we take actions to destroy ourselves or to destroy others. Yeah. God still cares for us. Like, so, you know, some, you know that, that is very different to what a human parent would generally do. Mm. When we take actions to harm humans, parents, other creations, you know, if we burnt our mum and dad's house down, for example, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I'm sure our mum and dad would be pretty disappointed with us. Yes. And, and probably for most parents would try to, you know, if, if we did it on purpose in particular, they would, they would try to uh, probably, you know, have some kind of resentful, recompense for that particular yes. thing yes. that we chose to do yeah. instead of uh, actually make, making sure that our next existence is even better than the one we just had. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, it, it, you know, it just demonstrates again the extent of God's love for the human soul. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Uh, we've kind of mentioned the next point. God ensured that the growth of the human soul is inevitable by patiently allowing time to work upon the condition of the human. Yeah, so it's sort of like um, what I noticed today uh, in most societies is there are a very, very strong desire nowadays is to, in business and, and in political and social uh, environments, mm -hmm. is to place time restrictions upon everything. Yeah. And, and we don't realise that uh, with God, we've been given basically an infinite amount of time to work through things. Mm. And, and this is a very loving thing to do, actually. You know, there's no, God's not trying to, he's saying that the more rapidly we work through things, the more rapidly we'll experience joy, but he's not pressuring us constantly to work through everything. Yeah. You know, we are allowed to choose our own time to, mm -hmm. to do things. And, and also, we're allowed to have, you know, thousands of years go by without doing anything, if that's what we so desire. Um, you know, and he's allowed us to do those things. He hasn't placed time restrictions on us. Mm. And, and the reality of that is quite, if you think about how loving that is, it's a very loving thing to do, yeah. to not place a time restriction on somebody yeah. to get something done or work through something. Obviously, God measures sincerity, though. Mm. So, so while God allows you to have a complete amount of time mm -hmm. for something, God also doesn't interact with people who are insincere. Yeah. So, you know, what his laws do, but he personally doesn't. Yeah. So, so he does that for a reason too. But mm. when, even when you consider that, he still allows time mm. to pass if we want time to pass in dealing with any issue. And, and God isn't resentful about the length of time that we take. Either. No, he's not saying, oh, you took a thousand <laughs> years to decide that I existed, so I'm going to punish you. Yeah, you have to suffer. <laughs> You've got to yeah. suffer a bit more because I, yeah. you took a thousand years to work it out, you know, yeah. whereas this other guy, he took 50 years to work it out, yeah. so I like him better. You yeah. know, that's not yeah. how he is, you know. Yeah. And, and it's a pretty wonderful yeah, thing, actually, because that's yeah. not what a human parent would do. Mm -hmm. human parent, if there were two children and a human parent goes, oh, my, you know, you haven't talked to me for 50 years. Mm. So the next time you try to talk to me, I'll say, well, you didn't talk to me for 50 years. I, I'm going to make another 50 years go by yeah. <laughs> before you don't, you know what I mean? Yes. Just to show you how bad you were. Yeah. You know, God doesn't do that to, yeah. to us. And, and that demonstrates God's care for us collectively. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I think we've just talked about this. God gives the same capacity and future potentials to all human souls and treats each child in exactly the same manner without partiality or favoritism. Yes, I feel this is another very important Beautiful. demonstration of mm -hmm. God's collective love for humanity. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, if God had favourites and, 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 you know, and also ones that he didn't like, obviously God's treatment would be very different mm -hmm. uh, between those two. Just like a human parent, as in most human parents uh, do that, they, mm -hmm. they have a favourite son or a favourite daughter and they treat that favourite son and favourite daughter a certain way and then, you know, obviously sometimes they even change the favourite son and favourite daughter based on, you know, what how they, the children how they, choose. Yeah. yeah, and what actions are taken by the children. Mm. God doesn't do any of that. God, to, each, to, to God, each child is a favourite child. Yeah. Each child, you know, so all of humanity are his favourite children. We are, you could say we are all children of a king mm. and and... This is the way God sees us, that we are all princes and, and, and princesses. You know, we're all children of the king. Mm. And, and uh, 
you know, that's a re remarkable thing, really, when you think about it, that, uh, to, to have billions and billions of children and yet all tr treat them all as favoured sons mm. or daughters is such a wonderful, you know, demonstration of God's capacity to love. Yeah, mm. yeah, mm. incredible. All right, well, there's plenty of evidence. And as we said in the intro, we could talk more. Obviously, we could, you could talk yeah. for years about this particular subject yes. alone. It's, uh, you know, there's many demonstrations, an infinite number, in fact, of demonstrations of God, how God feels about humans collectively. So yeah. we, it's important that we come to see that, you know, the, the way God has expressed God's love for humans is quite clear. Yeah. It's just that for us on earth, most of us try to deny such expressions yeah. or, you know, attribute such expressions to other events rather yes. than to God's creation. Yeah. And, and yet that's very illogical when you think mm. about it, because these, these creations, even the ones we've just mentioned, are very intricate mm. and demonstrate a huge amount of intelligent design. Mm. And, and the, the fact is that things, the intelligence in design doesn't come about by accident, as anybody who is a designer or an engineer knows. Mm. You have to sit down and work things out. There's a lot of mathematics involved. There's a lot mm -hmm. of science involved. And, and if there's a lot of mathematics and science involved for any human-based intelligent design, then surely there must be a lot more involved in these kind of intelligent designs that, that God has made. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's time that we started looking at things a lot more logically and realistically here rather than just looking at everything through our emotional condition when it yeah. comes to examining God. Yeah. God is not like religions define, yeah. and God is not what atheists define. Yes. God is an entity in himself or herself, and he and she obviously have a huge amount of intelligence, an infinite amount of intelligence, in fact, mm. and an infinite amount of capacity to experience emotions and feelings. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Mm. Incredible. All right. So that's how God feels about us collectively. Mm. We're actually going to refine this discussion now yeah. and talk uh, about some more particulars. Yes.